for dude. Get started. Okay. Um, so uh, I want to welcome everyone to uh, Peaks Leadership and Service Series panel number nine. Uh, today we're very lucky to host uh, Mr. Alec Ross. Um, for those of you that don't know, Mr. Ross is one of America's leading experts on innovation. He served for four years as senior advisor to Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, a role that earned him a Distinguished Honor Award from the State Department. He is currently a Distinguished Visiting Fellow at Johns Hopkins University um, and serves as an advisor to investors, corporations, and government leaders. Uh, Mr. Ross is also a New York Times bestselling author of this great book, um, The Industries of the Future, which we will talk about uh, more in depth in our conversation here. Um, and he lives in Baltimore with his wife and three young children, although now, uh, like you said at the beginning, he is in Italy. Um, thank you for being with us, sir, today. We really appreciate it. No, I couldn't be more pleased. And, you know, <clears throat> thank you for the leadership you've demonstrated organizing this and, you know, trying to, trying to help people shape their careers, understand some of, the, some of the opportunities that are out there and some of the paths to avoid. Yep. I mean, that's one of our main goals here at Peak is just to educate the youth um, and kind of show them what's out there, uh, you know, in the world as we are kind of becoming into this, getting into this globalized, uh, globalized age. So um, I wanted to start it off here, um, Alec. Could you kind of take us through your background, um, you know, growing up in West Virginia, uh, working in sort of these, I think, odd jobs during your summer years in college? Uh, and this unique path that you took, um, you know, to eventually being asked to serve as advisor to Secretary Clinton. Well, look, you're awfully nice to ask that. I mean, look, I'm a public school kid from West Virginia. There's an ounce of blue blood in this body. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, I had a, a mother nicknamed Becky the Barbarian uh, by my friends. My friends nicknamed her that who, you know, insisted that even though, you know, me, my brother, and my sister were public school kids in West Virginia, we were going to we, you know, we would not lack for opportunity. And so I, I went from growing up in West Virginia to Northwestern University. <clears throat> and as you alluded to, I did, you know, <laughs> before and after getting to college, you know, life in West Virginia, there were not, you know, fancy unpaid internships at law firms and investment banks and the like that, you know, a lot of my peers took advantage of. I needed to actually make some money on what was then a $3.35 an hour minimum wage. And so I did everything from work at a Bible bookstore to um, I worked as a midnight janitor. And so you, you very graciously held up that book, uh, The Industries of the Future, that the first sentence of The Industries of the Future is it's 2 a.m. and I'm mopping up whiskey smelling puke after a country music concert in Charleston, West Virginia. So I, I worked as a midnight janitor in a civic center. Let me tell you, being a midnight janitor after country music concerts in West Virginia is no joke. Um, <clears throat> things only moved up from there, you know, and so I got a job working on a beer truck, uh, which, you know, let me tell you, it's probably the hardest job I've had my entire life, um, you know, delivering beer and in, beer into the into the hollows and into the hills of Appalachia. And, you know, all these experiences gave me some of the grit that uh, I think continues to define me to this day. And after graduating from college, when trying to figure out what I wanted to do, I, you know, look, I, I Northwestern's in Chicago, and I was so, you know, having grown up amidst rural poverty and then sort of getting a close-up view of urban, urban poverty, I, I came out of that experience with a real sense of social justice rooted in what I believe to be the fact that talent was universally distributed, but opportunity was not. Like, yeah, I'm utterly convinced that the kids that I grew up with and in the hills of West Virginia were born with the same talent as the people who I eventually worked with, you know, in the White House and at the State Department. Um, and so after I left college, I joined Teach for America, which I think you're familiar with, right? Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, yeah. So it's funny, you know, on my way to Baltimore, where I did my student teaching, we did our summer, where we did our teaching, we did our summer teaching in Houston, Texas. And I did my summer teaching, I did that, the prep teaching at Jack Yates High School, beautiful Houston, Texas. And, you know, look, when I started teaching, 
most of the people on this call, if not all of them, um, grew up, you all grew up digital natives. You know, from your earliest days, there was the internet. But when I started teaching, it was sort of the beginning of the consumer internet. And, you know, and one of the things that I recognized, you know, in the 1990s when I was teaching is jobs were being lost in the port, factory, mine, and mill. One area of job growth was going to be in technology. And my students, you know, I taught in a school with 800 and some students, 100% African American, 100% um, poor. <clears throat> And you could make a series of assumptions about students like this, most of them wrong. Um, and one of the things I noticed was that they were all like fish in water when it came to the use of technology. And so over the course of my time teaching, I was like, you know, technology and sort of 21st century skills, this was right, or, you know, right before the 21st century. I was like, this could be a bridge to economic well-being. And so I co-founded a nonprofit, an NGO, the purpose of which was to go into poor communities and help bring access to, to technology, uh, skills development, online educational content. <clears throat> and that was, it was good timing. And through that, I got to know a then state senator who then ran for the United States Senate, who then ran for the presidency, a guy named Barack Obama. Um, we used to, we worked in his community on the south side of Chicago. And, you know, he sort of brought me from that nonprofit world into the political world. And so after being a public school teacher and then being at a nonprofit for eight years, I ran tech and media policy for his first presidential campaign. That went well. Um, and I then served in his administration. And that's, that's what took me to Hillary Clinton's office. Um, I wanted to, I've always sort of been an entrepreneur by nature, and there were all these fancy jobs that I could have taken, but I wanted to create a job that was all about innovation, but in America's foreign policy. Um, and so I talked to Hillary Clinton about this and I had helped beat her during the primary, right? Obama beat Hillary during that primary. And she, she remembered it. And um, she also remembered it that we did it with a little bit of class. And so I spent four years then sort of working at her elbow, working at the State Department, um, sort of an entrepreneur in our foreign policy. So I wasn't the IT guy. I was not in charge of Hillary Clinton's emails. Um, <laughs> but I was, in char I was in charge of this very edgy agenda about, you know, how can we bring sort of the most innovative, edgy digital solutions to foreign policy challenges from, you know, whether it's earthquake relief in Haiti to helping refugees in Syria to restoring communications in rebel-held territory in Libya during the revolution. I was sort of the, almost like a startup CEO inside the State Department. And so that was sort of my path from hills of West Virginia to the white hot center of geopolitical power in Washington, DC. Yeah, well, I mean, I think uh, when I was doing a little studying on you, uh, I was immensely, I think, inspired by hearing that because, you know, at the time that you're uh, kind of going through things, I think you kind of only see that now, but I think the way that you have um, kind of built this career is extraordinary. Um, so actually just one quick question detour before we move on here. Uh, when you met uh, Mr. Uh, Obama at first, you know, what were your initial impressions? Did you think, hey, this guy could be, you know, president one time? No. Um, he was impressive. But he, I'll, I mean, look, he was a state senator, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and state senators are a dime a dozen. You know, he, he, but he struck me as, I mean, look, he was the president of the, he had been president of the Harvard Law Review constitutional law professor at the University of Chicago. So he's much more erudite than sort of your typical state senator, obviously. Mm -hmm. But the thing that compelled me about him was his synthesis. Um, you know, his ability to take what was happening in the Section 8 housing project we were working on in the south side of Chicago and sort of map that to the larger economics, the larger technological trends. So what he, sh it's interesting, he, what he showed me was a, the horsepower, the raw IQ and the ability to make these connections. But when I first met him, it was 2003. So this is like 
five, you know, this is back in the day, this is, he had no shot at being elected to the Senate, <clears throat> much less to the presidency. And he was still a little bit, almost like a cult. You know what I'm saying? He wasn't a stallion yet. I mean, there was a little bit of awkwardness uh-huh. in, you know, the sort of the, he, he's as cool as the other side of the pillow now, right? It's all polished, super mm-hmm. polished. But at the time, there still was this little bit of a culty thing with him mm-hmm. where he could dial it up, but then, you know, every now and then he would get very professorial, mm-hmm. you know, pedantic. Mm-hmm. Um, so he had not yet refined mm-hmm. what he later did. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, so a lot of people just think about Barack Obama as he is today. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he's, I mean, this is now 17 years ago mm-hmm. when I first met him. So, I mean, he's changed a lot over 17 years and not just all at once. He was an elected president and he became the Barack Obama that we now know. I mean, there has been a progression. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, none of us are ever finished products. Yeah. No, I mean, that's why I think uh, I just wanted to get into that a little bit because you know, me included, a lot of the students as well, we've seen, I think, President Obama as just president, especially in the last years of his term. So I thought it'd be interesting to kind of hear your thoughts on the beginning. And I then- mean, one, thing that's, one thing that's interesting about Obama is he was actually considered not to be among the sort of winners of his Harvard Law School class. Mm-hmm. I mean, he was the president of Harvard Law Review. And then by the time he was in his like late 30s, like most of his peers had sort of lapped him a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, He didn't really get into academia. Um, You know, he taught at the University of Chicago, but he didn't get on tenure track. He got into politics, but he was like a locally elected official. Mm -hmm. Um, So he was, he was, it was interesting. Then there were all these fancy friends of his who were making a lot of money or who had big jobs in the Clinton administration or things like this. And so what was interesting is even though he became the president that we now know as Barack Obama, and even though he became the president that we now know as Barack Obama at a young age, through his 30s, I think he was probably pretty frustrated by his impact and his development. Mm -hmm. But he didn't give up, and he took some really big chances, you know, especially with that last Senate run. I mean, he got his ass kicked running for Congress, got just destroyed. Um, and his resilience and his willingness to not be crushed by failure took him from being a guy who got his ass kicked in 2000 running from Congress to somebody who runs for and wins the United States Senate in 2004 and then president four years after that. Yeah, I mean, that's why I think uh, a lot of people kind of view it as a star story, but they don't know but all these hardships that he had to go through. So, I mean, like you said, I guess the future at the time for him was kind of uncertain and he didn't even know. I mean, he, he might've had the ambition, but I think, you know, he might, might have not, not have known that he would have gotten that far. I mean, I think he certainly had the ambition. I mean, he's never lacked for ambition, but I think he had highs and lows. And when he had his lows, what he didn't do is say, all right, I'm going to go take that, profe- I'm going to go take that, partnership at that like downtown Chicago law firm um Mm. you know and so he sort of stayed true he stayed on course even though a lot of people in his peer networks were making a lot more money were having a lot more of what could be objectively characterized as success he just he stayed on target great well thank you for that uh I know we went a little tangent there sir but thank you um so uh, I think a question that some of our members here at Peak had was, you know, having served as Clinton's uh, senior advisor, uh, what was the global situation at the time, uh, and what were some of your key takeaways? It's a big question. Um, so, look, the global situation was we were transitioning out of the let's call it, you know what they call the war on terror. So, you know, we for many many years, our foreign policy was principally de- defined by anti-terrorism. Um, this led to a series of ab- abuses, you know, Abu Ghraib and in Iraq and what have you. Um, and so a lot of what we were trying to do was restore America's standing abroad, um, which unfortunately we need, you know, needs to happen all over again to an even greater degree than was the case 12 years ago. 
The other thing that is notable within the global situation is this was also a period when lots of revolutions were starting. Tunisia, Egypt, Syria, Libya. Um, and so it was the beginning of that, democratic and non-democratic movements. And then the last thing was, it was right on the heels of the financial crisis. Um, so a lot of people on this phone call won't remember that, but you know, in the same way in which we all recognize the economic pain of COVID, particularly for working and working class folks, um, you know, we were also navigating our way through an economic crisis. And I guess, look, I'll give you a couple of very quick takeaways. Um, one is, I'll, I'll say something that I think we didn't do especially well. I think we were insufficiently bold, um, you know, especially with economic policy making. I mean, what gave rise to Donald Trump in part was the economic stagnation of America's working and middle class. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we rec there was an economic recovery, but a lot of that recovery was, yes, people got jobs, you know, unemployment was very low, but the actual quality of those jobs were not great. And oftentimes people had to have two jobs where they once would have had one. And, you know, even though there was full employment, the cost of housing, the cost of education and the cost of healthcare were higher than ever before. And, and you know, we were talking earlier, um, Vishal, about, you know, how Barack Obama has always evolved. <clears throat> I think if you took Barack Obama today and put, put him back in 2009, 2010, I think he would have been a lot more daring with his economic mm -hmm. policy making. So that I do think with great power, you actually do have to use that power. You gotta mm -hmm. use it. So that's, you know, it's no point in having if you don't use it. Um, second and last takeaway, I guess I'll, I'll give to you is, I think that a lot of what my teams did best, they did best because I had lots of young people working for me. So we were working in an environment of a lot of people with very long resumes, ambassador, minister, blah, 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 blah. you know, these very distinguished backgrounds. And what I did is I brought in a lot of younger people um, who brought really fresh perspectives. And I sort of used my power and my standing as a way to let these young people get some of their ideas in. And not all of them were good. And some of their programs totally failed. Mm -hmm. um, that's okay. And one of my key takeaways is, you know, it's don't over punish failure. Treat a misdemeanor like a misdemeanor, don't treat it like a felony. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the things, a lot of the projects that we went into that we thought were gonna succeed failed. But some of the things that we thought were only of sort of modest probability or modest possibility ended up like boiling the ocean, having a huge impact. Um, yeah. Yeah. So um, I think hearing about, you know, how you approached, I think your role in the department is very interesting to say. Um, and I think another question that we kind of had is, you know, here at Peak, our students are working on these projects to kind of solve these small community issues, right? You know, whether they feel like, oh, we need to advance technological skills in an area, or we need to, you know, empower these students to go work on, you know, voting rights in their, mm -hmm. or, or voter registration in their areas, right? When you were in the State Department, right, you guys are facing these huge problems, um, you know, globally across these different countries and landscapes and things like that. What was your approach to solving those issues? Well, let me first say that, you know, remember that this was preceded by my spending eight years working at an NGO where we focused on what you might call local problems, right? Um, so I think that there is, you know, whether you're solving a problem in a neighborhood, which it's like, hey, we've got only half of this precinct um, is registered to vote and it's an underrepresented minority and we want them to participate in our democracy and they don't really understand the value and virtue of voting. Like the same methodology in certain respects that you take to the local problem solving, you take to solving a huge problem. Um, and I guess what I would say is, I, look, I've always been on the side of boldness, you know, to the point of controversy, to the point of occasional semi-scandal. Um, 
I think that too many people take these sort of incremental approaches to try to, trying to solve problems. And I think that, you know, life grinds you down a little bit. And when life grinds you down, it sort of pushes you toward incrementalism. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying incrementalism is bad, but what I'm saying is that my biggest successes, and look, my team did have some enormous successes. You know, we came out of the Obama administration, you know, with, you know, not a parade, but people feeling pretty good about what our impact was. Mm -hmm. I say, I feel like it's because we didn't focus on incrementalism. We, we took the mission, like the big goal, and then we actually built a plan around how to get to the big goal. While a lot of the time, you know, some of the sort of more institutionalized or more established players would have said, oh, you know, you can't do that in five or 10 years. And we've been doing this for years. And don't you know, you have to do this first and that first. And just tuning that out, being really, really bold, um, being audacious, being fearless, like that's actually how you, actually how we solve the stuff. Yeah, I think what you're saying now is gold, and I hope uh, my students in the audience are taking notes here. Um, so I wanted to shift gears a little bit here, um, you know, from your time in the Clinton administration to talking about some of the things that you wrote in your book, right? So okay. the book is mentioned, uh, Industries of the Future, uh, and you talk about these new burgeoning industries where the future is going to come from, right? Uh, and among them, you mentioned these fields, robotics, genomics, big data, um, uh, and, you know, along with other things like cyber warfare, which is going to be a huge problem moving forward. Um, you know, how can students really position themselves to be successful in these fields? And I think, yeah, you had wrote a little bit about uh, multicultural, I think, sensitivity, having that ability to talk with different cultures, understand that it was a huge deal. Um, could you just talk about that a little bit and some other things you view as well? Sure. Let, so let me give you a couple of, a couple things. You know, first of all, I think that computer code is the alphabet that much of the future is going to be written in. And so the same way in which, you know, look, even if you aren't going to become an accountant, you still learn how to add, subtract, multiply, and divide, right? Mm -hmm. And even if you aren't going to become a journalist or an author, you still learn to read and write. I, I think that similarly computer coding is something that's foundational, not because we're saying, oh, everybody needs to go become a computer scientist. But I do think, especially for younger people, having a grounding in the code that will be increasingly central in all of our lives as the zeros and ones of computer code animate more and more industries is really important. So I'm not saying go be a computer scientist. I'm not. But I am saying in the same way in which you learn how to read, write, multiply, divide, um, add and subtract, learn the basics of coding. That's thing one. Mm -hmm. Thing two is I do believe in a world of increasingly powerful machines, that which makes us most human grows more important. I mean, if you think about it, we're all sort of cyborgs right now, right? Like I'm talking to you and Vaishnav and, you know, everybody else and we're human, but we are talking to each other right now through machines. And what I see of you is a computer image. Um, so we're all sort of cyborgy already. Mm -hmm. um, but the funny thing is that in this cyborgy world, where increasingly labor is one of two things, either you're telling a machine what to do or a machine's telling you what to do. Mm -hmm. You know, what I worry about for the students that I taught, for the students that you teach, for the students that are out, that are out there, is that they're, gonna, they're just being positioned to be the ones that, who are being, to being told by machines what to do. So first thing is you do need to learn to code, but the second thing is that there are a set of skills that are very human that I believe are growing in importance. Um, and these are skills that we associate with the humanities from communication skills to an understanding of behavioral psychology to emotional intelligence. You know, in a world of distributed staffs and communications over Zoom, emotional intelligence and understanding behavioral psychology has never been more important. So I actually am a big believer in interdisciplinary learning. You know, taking something that is technical and scientific or nature and, and studying it, but also studying alongside it things that we may associate with the humanities. I mean, Scheel is an interesting example. I think he was a bio and public policy major. 
So this is what I'm talking about. It's something scientific along with something from the humanities um, brought together. And then last is, you know, to your point, it's about multicultural fluency. You know, uh, the more good old fashioned ink stamps you have in your passport, the more your ability to move sort of between communities and between countries on this 196 country chessboard, that's going to grow in importance because we live in a world that over the past several decades has been defined by globalization and we're only going to grow more global. Um, don't let this period of COVID make you think that, you know, globalization is going to stop. <clears throat> it's not, it's, you know, we live in an, we live in a world where the world is growing smaller and where our communities are growing increasingly connected. Even if those connections lead to conflict, they are still increasingly connected. So I do believe the ability to communicate and work across communities is of greater and greater importance. Yeah, and um, I think last week, Dr. Albion, who is the founder of Net Impact, he came on um, and he was talking about how COVID has really, I think, accelerated this process of us moving online technically. Um, you know, how do you view COVID really changing the situation? So, I, you know, I think that it's important to not take a religious view or say, oh, well, this is always going to be this way forever. Like, I'm a little skeptical about that. I do think that we will, I do think that for a lot of people, as soon as there's a vaccine, it's like, all right, 40 hours back in the office, Monday to Friday, nine to five. But I think that that will be far less the case than was the case previously. I do think that, you know, we will, I, I, I think that part of what this has accelerated is the notion of work as being something rooted in time and place to being something more outcomes based. It's less were you here at 10 a.m. on Tuesday for this meeting and more did you help execute against the goal that we set out here. But there is, but you know, this is a very privileged view as well, which is, you know, when I think about this, I think, I, you know, I call it the white collar quarantine. There are lots of kinds of work that are much more easily done online than others. And it tends to be knowledge work. It tends to be the work of people who go to work with wearing shirts with collars um, as opposed to people in service industries. So I do think that while it will change the nature of work and while I do think we will see a little bit more rural distribution and maybe a little bit of de-densifying some of our urban centers where everybody feels like they have to work in like this one building in this one neighborhood, um, I'm wary of jumping to sort of wild conclusions about that. Uh, what I do hope is that this pause that COVID has given us gives us the opportunity to rethink certain aspects of our social contract. You know, the relationship between business, people, and government. Um, I think that, you know, what part of what COVID has revealed is what works and what doesn't. And, you know, the very uh, part of what it revealed was you know, some, who some of our essential workers really are. You know, some of our essential workers really are the people who pick up our garbage. Some of the essential workers are the people who uh, work in meat packing plants or, you know, harvest our vegetables and get them to the supermarket. So what I do hope is that this gives us this pause presented by COVID makes us think a little bit more singularly about our social contract but I take a less than utopian view on what the results will be. I am hopeful, but not utopian. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I think uh, you go a lot more depth, you know, on some of these subjects uh, about, I mean, I was really amazed about some of the things that you talk about genomics. I think that wasn't something that's on everyone's minds uh, because yeah. it is very interesting how, you know, a lot of the countries are already thinking about how they can position themselves to best succeed, you know, in the next decade. And I think genomics is a very cool bridge, like you said, between the humanities, you know, being able to have medicine, computer science, all these different fields come together and work on. So uh, again, I mean, for those of you that uh, are really interested in technology, want to see what the futures look like, uh, I really encourage you guys to read this book. I had a great time going through it. Um, Thank you. And it was very, I think, knowledgeable. Um,
And so before we transition into our last uh, question from our end, uh, I would encourage the audience to start thinking of questions uh, that they have for uh, Alec. And you know, you can just private message us that on the chat and I can go ahead and uh, read these for you guys. So our last question here to wrap up from our end, uh, Alec, is, you know, as you've noticed, have you, as you have, you know, worked in government yourself, uh, our country has become, you know, increasingly polarized. Um, and, you know, progress in politics has been rare to say the least. Uh, what is your take on the state of the nation? Um, you know, the upcoming election, I don't know if you had a chance to watch the debate. Um, and the role that, you know, Americans will be playing at the ballot box in November. So I'm going to, I'm going to I could give you a cute answer, but I'm going to give you my honest answer. Um, my honest answer is that we that that the state the the state of our democracy is substantially weaker than it's been certainly do, during my lifetime, um, and I think that the Trump presidency presents an existential threat to our president to our democracy. I mean, I just genuinely believe that. I mean, I believe that Donald Trump is a very 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 bad person. I believe that, and I don't believe that he believes in democracy. I mean, he he is challenging the foundations of our democratic institutions. He is trying to undermine the legitimacy of the upcoming election. I think if Donald Trump wins re-election, then, you know, America's plus minus 70 years of global leadership is all but gone. You know, we will have great companies, we'll have plenty of economic well-being, but I think our global standing will be eroded to the point where it's, it's not recoverable. Um, so it's never been a, more important than now um, to engage politically. People who say, oh, I don't like politics or I don't like politicians. Well, that you behind politics and politicians is everything. I mean, it, it, politics and politicians set the laws that, you know, and, and fund and manage the programs that build our streets and, you know, keep those streets safe and build our schools and put teachers in those schools. And so it's, you know, look, we cannot brush off the power and importance of democratic participation at this moment. And, you know, I'm struck. I think a lot of you are in Texas, right? Not all of you, but a lot of you. Yes. I mean, tech, I mean Texas is a fascinating place in this perspective. I mean, Texas is a place of changing demographics um it's a place where sort of the good old boy 65 year old white guy hillbilly um who's always been in charge of everything is being challenged and every four years people say well give us another four years give us another eight years there will be a new generation there will be more diversity there will be more participation well look i, I just i hope 2020 is the year where we can get some new and different kinds of people involved in politics. And it's not just sort of good old boy politics. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really worried about your generation. And, you know, I know there are people from a varied ages here, but like, I'm really worried about all of those of you who could be call it first, second or third time voters, where there's a lot of certain kinds of activism and engagement, you know, there's, participation in social media, there's participation in protests, but then it comes time to vote and voter participation just breaks your heart. I mean, it just voter participation among people who are, you know, 17 to 35 is really not good. But there's more of the future that you're going to have to live in than people over 35. So mm -hmm. you, have, you have more at stake in this election than anybody else. So what I am just, I am praying for um, is youth to not just express themselves, not just activate, but engage in the most important act of democratic participation, which is voting. Mm -hmm. And at te in Texas, you are at the white hot center of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, mean, I think there's a big campaign uh, in our school with Ms. Collins, who's leading the voter registration effort. Um, and again, for you know those of us that are in Texas, voter registration deadline 
is on October 5th. Correct me if I'm wrong, uh, someone in the audience, but I believe that's the last day we can kind of register to vote. So I think it is very important, like uh, Mr. Ross says here, for us to you know directly be involved in the democracy uh, by voting. And so, you know, with that, I want to kind of shift to some of the questions I've gotten from the audience. Um, I've actually gotten a couple here, so I'm just going to go ahead and uh, call on them. So. Vaishnav, can you come off of mute and then, you know, introduce yourself in your answer, please? Sure. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Ross, for being here with us today. My name is Vaishnav, and my question for you is, having worked in <clears throat> the highest levels of government and having advised on the most consequential decisions made in the past decade, how do you weigh the consequences of your decisions and the government's decisions? And what habits can our youth cultivate to become effective decision makers? I think he might have gotten disconnected. Um, I guess while we're waiting for Mr. Ross, uh, I would really encourage you guys to think of questions. Um, we have gotten a couple here, which are pretty, pretty, I think, unique. Sorry, sir, were you? Sorry about that. I think I got kicked off there for a second. No worries. I, um, were, you, were you able to hear Vaishnav's question? Or I was, I apologize. I did hear the question. Okay. So, no. and so I'll answer it quickly. I apologize. Um, so look, Barack Obama was the best at this. You know, there were many times where he was given the opportunity to, to come up with an answer to something with nothing but imperfect options somebody was going to die. Um, and a lot of the time, lots of people were going to die. Um, no matter what he picked, there were going to be dead bodies. Um, this is life in the White House Situation Room. And he was, you know, for those of you that have watched Star Trek, he was almost like, you know, Mr. Spock. Um, he's very, you know, the opposite of Trump in that is very cool very analytical. He got the facts, was very data-driven, very values-oriented, and not a lot of emotion. I mean, it was weighty, but he didn't let emotion or politics drive a decision. A lot of the time, he made de decisions that were bad politically, but good analytically, and he always made, he, he, he always chose values and analytics over politics and emotion. And so that's what I would say to all of you. Um, not everything's gonna be in the White House Situation Room where you're weighing probabilities of different body counts, but you can always make the choice of values and analytics versus politics and emotion. Politics and emotion will, can take you in one direction where values and analytics take you in another. And you sometimes have to live with the consequences if you swim against the stream of what the emotional environment or what the political environment is, but you're gonna sleep better and ultimately you're gonna get a better result if you do the right thing in terms of value-based decision-making rooted in, rooted in strong analytics. So I think yeah, why should I answer your question? Thank you. Um, so I'm, I actually have a few other questions coming in from people. Okay. Um, so Ms. Looper here is asking, um, my question is around him expanding more about how he sees we can get young people, teens and young adults, enhanced social emotional skills so they can better cope with the stress and anxiety we're seeing grow. Tagging on to his point about the unprecedented times we're seeing in the political scene. Yeah, so I appreciate Ms. Looper asking that question. Um, and I'd love to just give an answer. My wife actually would probably be able to give a better answer to that than I would. You know, she is, she's a teacher herself. And let me just sort of acknowledge the problem that she is speaking about, which are the, the mental stresses and the emotional stresses that existed before COVID. 
um, but which have been substantially exacerbated thereafter. You know, I guess what I would say is, you know, and this, I hope this doesn't sound ridiculous, is every parent and every teacher needs to recognize that in addition to stewarding a child, a young person's academic well-being, they also now need to increasingly be focused on stewarding that young person's emotional well-being. Um, you, you know, I do feel like today versus 20 years ago, I think that we are more cognizant of mental health issues. I think we are more aware of the need for self-care. Um, but I also think we're more aware of it in part because I think that a lot of this technology which enables productivity, which enables connectivity and other things actually can be for teenagers really, really, really dangerous too, if over consumed. And so to Ms. Looper, I would say, you know, one of the, you know, without being a behavior, without being a psychiatrist, um, I just cannot help but think that in the same way in which we pay a lot of attention to what we put in our bodies, right? You know, if you put sugar and fat and you eat all day into your, into your body and you don't regulate what you eat and you don't eat how, you don't regulate how often you eat, you don't regulate the quantity of your eat, you know, it's gonna make your physical body sick. I think that similarly with technology, particularly for young people, um, if they are ingesting content all day and it's really not healthy content, then it's making their minds sicker um, because their minds are developing in a way that's very different. Their minds are developing at, at a time where if you're putting bad stuff into it all the time, then I think you, that you're going to see um, mutations that are deeply unhealthy. So look, I think that there are, it's a really important question, and I, I have an, a less than expert response to it, but I just can't help but feel like in the same way in which we monitor the food that we put in our body and think about it and are conscious of it and are aware of what the outcomes are for that, recognizing that for young people and technology, it has a huge impact. Thank you for that, um, Mr. Ross. So I'm actually gonna call on one of our students next. Um, so I think Karthik had a question. Could you come off and mute, Karthik? Yeah, sure. Hey, Mr. Ross, uh, my name is Karthik. Um, a quick question. So with an increasing competition in blockchain technology, particularly in healthcare, how do you see policies adapting to that? Because in healthcare, patients' privacy is key, essentially. Yeah, thank you for that question, Karthik. So this is a case where public policy and technological innovation are very difficult to cohere. Um, so HIPAA, you know, which is the law that governs most patient privacy, is really in consonant with the way that most networks work. Um, and, you know, everything from the digitization of health records to the interoperability of systems across, to the interoperability of, of data information sharing across health systems, are oftentimes made substantially more difficult by the regulatory and statutory regime around um, the sharing of personal data. Um, this is a case where blockchain, I think, can be a part of the solution because it is simultaneously, it can be, an, it can be encrypted. I mean, it's encrypted, but it can allow for the secure transmission of, it, of information in a way that I think provide some hope. Now, blockchain is one of those technologies that I think it was one of those things that was sort of overhyped at first, um, in part, be part because a lot of productization had not actually been done around it. I mean, people were really excited about the technology. Um, I think it's probably the most significant sort of digital technology innovation since HTML. Mm -hmm. The difference is that with HTML, hypertext markup language, the ability to sort of use it to make the internet visual and na navigable was much more immediate and which was much had a much low, lower bar barrier to entry than productizing around blockchain. Um, so I think that what we really need to see with blockchain, particularly in the healthcare space, 
are some breakthroughs and some large systems like the Kaiser Permanentes and others really getting behind a single set of solutions that in the same way in which, you know, you go on a website right now, you don't say, oh, I'm looking at HTML. You don't, you're on a website. In the same way, what I think is that that ought to be the case with blockchain, where it's sort of the invisible enabling technology that codifies trust, um, and but which isn't something that we necessarily think a lot about. So we are in a nine inning game, I would say we're sort of in the second inning in terms of blockchain. But some of its greatest potential is, as you referred to Karthik, is in the healthcare space to enable privacy while also enabling very necessary data sharing uh, across systems. Thank you. Yeah, and Karthik is actually one of our student leaders at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Oh, wow. So, I mean, look, you know, the University of Illinois uh, Urbana-Champaign, I mean, that's sort of at the center of the creation of a lot of this, right? I mean, the computer science department there with, with Andreessen back in 90 and 91 and, um, you know, Mosaic and the wet. I mean, look, uh, where you are right now is a place where a lot of these big problems get sussed out and solved. So what I would say to you, Karthik, is in the same way in which I think a lot of the best university-based breakthroughs come from students and student researchers who are able to sort of tune out a lot of what's in the market and just build something beautiful, um, build something beautiful rooted on their original computer science based on their original conception of how something should work. That's where I'd really push you. Don't pay attention to what some nonsense consulting company is developing for some big healthcare system. Imagine how you think these technologies could and should work and then, you know, build it. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. Yeah, tune out the market. Yeah, thank you for that, sir. Um, so our next question is um, Miss Amy Collins. Uh, I think I asked her to unmute. Oh, sorry, I think I just unmuted. Oh, oh my God, I'm sorry. Mr. Ross, uh, thank you so much for your time. I sincerely appreciate it. I teach with uh, Mr. Caravanke, and so there's a lot of our students that are on this call. So thank you so much for your time. What I would ask you to do, and I am um, closer to your generation, you and I uh, have some very similar um, political experiences, et cetera, but what I would ask you to do is, is if you could reiterate for our high school students, thinking about you know the, the upcoming future for them, what would be three skills that you would say um, that they really need to focus on as opposed to content and, and learning knowledge in, in high school classrooms? What would be a skill? And if you could give us maybe your top three about sure. uh, skills that you would like them to really focus on for their, for their next steps. Sure. So first of all, and this is the first number one is going to sound really boring, but it's really important. For whatever reason in 2020, finding people with really great written communication skills, it's, 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 it's an increasingly scarce skill. So what I would say is skill number one, if you are a great writer, there is a job out there for you. Um, it's as simple as that. That's number one. Number two, going back to some of what I said earlier, even if you're a great writer or you're a great artist, you're, you know, uh, masterful in, in theater, still learn to code. Um, you know, I do really believe that computer code is the alphabet that much of the future is going to be written in. And then third and last is languages. Um, it is so much easier to learn a, for, uh, a foreign language, a non-native language, uh, you know, earlier in your life than it is later in your life. What it means to be able to communicate with somebody in a language that is not your own, you're able to cross barriers. Um, there's a difference between translation and communication and being able to really communicate with people in a language other than your own, um, I think is growing in importance. I mean, all three of my kids study Chinese. Um, I think two of the three of them study it now, but like I've got a 17 year old at Harvard right now. And I think part of the reason why he got to be a 17 year old studying at Harvard coming out of the public schools of Baltimore, Maryland is because he learned to speak Chinese. Um, 
and so going back to some of the points that I was making earlier about the, the need to be able to work across communities, I think Americans are oftentimes can oftentimes be a little bit arrogant um, in term and you know almost colonial in terms of how they engage with the outside world and the ability to actually communicate effectively um, in a foreign language is really important. So again, written communications, learn to code, learn to speak a learn to speak a foreign language. And if you speak Spanish and English, learn to speak Chinese. If you speak, you know, learn to speak a non-Indo-European language if you can. Thank you for that, Ms. Ross. So we're going to take three more questions after this one. Um, and we're going to, I'm actually going to call on one of our students. Uh, Jonah, um, can you go ahead and read your question for Mr. Ross, please? Uh, I was asking, uh, what did it take to work with Hillary Clinton? Uh, what did it take? It, you know, what I would say, first of all, is a lot of hustle. Um, you know, the way I, you know, I don't know that I was the smartest person um, among the probably 100 people who would have liked to have had the job that I had, but I know I outworked them. Um, and in fact, the way that I got to run tech and media policy for Barack Obama's presidential campaign, Obama knew who I was, but like this was a presidential campaign and I had no experience working on presidential campaigns and I got to run tech and media policy for it. And I didn't necessarily have the expertise in tech and media policy that a lot of other people did, but you know what I did? That nobody, I, I, I worked harder than everybody else did. Um, and what's interesting is, is I worked really, 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 really hard. The skills developed. So they certainly became interrelated. There's no substitution for outworking everybody else. Like if you are trying to develop a certain set of skills and you have a choice between playing video games with some of your friends um, or continuing to grind down on, you know, the skill that you're trying to develop, Honestly, a lot of the time that, you know, to the extent that you can focus on the skill, that's all the better. I mean, one thing that's interesting is when I was growing up, uh, you know, let's talk, talk about somebody in their teens. Like a lot of the people who were most popular in their teens, they sort of won being teenagers, but lost being in their 20s. Because a lot of those people who were teenagers, but who were working really hard, maybe not having as much fun as some other people, they were sort of social, but they weren't all social all the time. The 25-year-olds, who may have not been the most popular 15-year-olds, they were a lot more popular come 25. Um, because suddenly, you know, they were the ones who had the great career. They were the ones who had the success. They were the ones who had the money. And, you know, the beautiful cheerleader was suddenly interested in this person who she was not interested in or he was not interested in years earlier. So there's no substitute for hard work. You don't have to be the smartest, um, but you do have to work the hardest if you want to get to that really top level, like I did working for Hillary Clinton and Obama. Yep. Thank you. I hope uh, Jonah takes that to heart and, you know, gets on the stats work today. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> all right. So the next one is Shashrik. And then after that, we got one more. Uh, hi, Alec. Uh, my name's Shashrik and I have a question here regarding data privacy and data rights. Mm -hmm. So I think within like the past four to five years, uh, we've kind of seen, uh, data privacy becoming more of an issue um, due to things like scandals such as the Cambridge Analytical scandal. So how do you see, uh, you know, regulation uh, taking place over the next uh, decade or so to protect data rights of people who are on uh, websites such as social media? And uh, well, what type of actions do you think are really best suited to tackle that issue? It's a great question. I'm, I am, how to put this? I think that in many respects, a lot of the best 
innovations that are waiting for us in the area of digital privacy and digital rights will actually be a function of entrepreneurship as opposed to regulation. What do I mean by that, right? What do I mean by that? A lot of business models have been built around, you know, something is apparently free, but it's not free because what you're doing is you're giving up your data, right? I cannot help but think that if somebody were to build a Facebook right now that didn't have advertising, didn't have a data tracking, but you know, you had to pay $5 a month for, and if it were beautifully designed, I bet it would be a big success. Um, so I do, th so taking regulation out of it, uh, out of it for a second, I do believe that entrepreneurs, particularly, you know, people who are in their teens and in their twenties today, who value the, who value data privacy and who in their peer networks think it's very important, actually starting businesses where part of the values you are transmitting to a con potential consumer base is, Hey, here's what we're going to do with your data and here's what we're not going to do with your data could be compelling. There's no, there are no more powerful forces than market forces. So the first thing is I think that to the extent that the market can actually exercise power here, that's good. But to, more specifically to your question on regulation, the problem, um, Sashrik, and I say this having worked in international tech policy, is there tends to be a very, very, very big gap between the understanding of these issues by policymakers and regulators and by the entrepreneurs and users. Like in my next book that doesn't get put, published until next year, but I'm writing it now. I mean, I say in my son's high school class, there's you know much more sophistication about data privacy in my son's high school um, class than there is you know, uh, you know, in the West Wing of the White House. Um, Congress is getting better, but they're having a, a, a hearing where they don't sound completely coherent, where they don't sound completely incoherent is a long way from new regulations, new laws. And so, you know, what's funny is, you know, a lot of the time when these sort of celebrity CEOs get called to testify before Congress, they may get beaten up a little, but nothing then happens. It's not like, not only is a new law not being passed, a new law isn't even being drafted and being put up for a vote. And then in Europe, where they do have have a far, where they are much further ahead than the United States in this regard, things like GDPR are fairly toothless um, and fairly, I mean, it's you click a box, you move forward, nothing's changed. So I think that, you know, honestly, it's going to be your generation, it's going to be younger folks who look at these issues with completely fresh sets of eyes and build regulatory and business models around these things that are uncontemplated in Brussels, in Paris, in Washington. I don't see the sort of, going back to some of what I was talking about earlier with incrementalism, the sort of hyper incrementalism on, on data privacy right now, I think is actually the enemy of getting anything meaningful done. So I actually think that to the extent that people have big, bold, big ideas that could either become a big, bold policy agenda or a big, bold idea for a new company that will use data differently, that's how, how you actually move the needle here. Um, and, you know, just thinking about the United States right now, I don't think that either a Biden or a, either a Biden administration or a second, second term Trump administration, I don't see them being especially evangelical on this issue. I mean, where the Biden administration has a stronger view since to, seems to be on Section 230 of the Communications Act related to platform responsibility as opposed to data privacy per se. And the Trump administration has very little sophistication on this. Um, so you're going to have to come up with this. I don't think it's coming out of Brussels or Washington anytime soon. Thank you. Yep. And I, I would you say like electing younger people could be a solution to that problem as well? So I think that some of the young people who we've elected to office, even some of those who I don't disagree, who I don't agree with about everything, I think that they've been so good. Like, they, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm really inspired by some of the young people who we've elected to office mm -hmm. who don't just accept the system as it is, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, in the same way in which, you know, I and my team were able to really 
change the State Department and change America's foreign policy because we just didn't accept it. Like it didn't matter how many 60 year old ambassadors told us how things work. We had our own really clear vision. I do see a lot of these younger elected officials who fundamentally do not accept the way that things work um, and push things in a very different direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, and I really appreciate you kind of answering that question there. Um, so, you know, I think it's important that these young people like us really try to get involved as much as possible. So Finlay, um, sorry if I mispronounced that, we'll actually close this out for here. Um, she has a great question. Um, so you can go ahead and ask it, Finlay. Okay, yeah. Um, thank you so much for talking with us today. I really appreciate it. Um, I am a senior at UT Austin, and mm -hmm. I feel like during COVID and kind of in some part, uh, just since the 2016 election, it feels like our generation has um, really come to see the kind of uh, grip capitalism and corporate greed have over the government. Um, and I feel like in the past, um, I and many of my classmates have thought about working for the government, but are disillusioned and discouraged by the effect um, business interest has over um, government work currently. So I guess what would you say to students who want to make change in the world, specifically like through a government path, but are discouraged by all the systems that are currently trying to do that, um, but in a maybe not efficient and not ethical manner? It's a good work for government. I mean, I'm dead serious. I mean, does corporate, does corporate, is corporate power real? Absolutely. Um, but you know what, when I worked in, when I worked at the State Department, when I worked in the Obama administration, you know, they could send all the fancy CEOs they wanted at us and all the corporate CEO, all the corporate lobbyists they wanted at us. And I had my, I, I made up my own mind. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't curl into the fetal position over this. Um, I wouldn't, I look people, a lot of people dismiss government as being inefficient, as being, you know, captured by corporates. I just know my own experience in it, where a lot of young idealistic people were able to do things that were really bold. Um, and I guess the other thing that I would say is I don't view this as being black and white, or I, I don't view business as being evil. Um, what I do believe is that I think that a lot of business interests corrupt the public policy process. And so for me, the way I approached it was I wasn't anti-business, but I wasn't going to allow our team's work to be corrupted by commercial interests. And, you know, I, I guess I just wouldn't, I, I, I wouldn't be discouraged. Um, I wouldn't be discouraged. I mean, look, corporate interests have a lot more effect over the nonprofit sector than they do over government um, because nonprofits are entirely 100% funded by philanthropic contributions. And those philanthropic contributions inevitably, they don't come in the form of lots of $5 donations. They come in the form of grants. And those grants come from either foundations or corporations. And, the corp and in the case of corporations, it's corporate money. In the case of foundations, it's the money of people who tend to, to, have, been, who, to have gotten very wealthy because of their work in, in, um, in the private sector. So I actually think that government is one of the most effective places that you can go to make change. No environment is perfect. But don't think for a second that the nonprofit sector is any more pure or more holy than government. Um, if anything, there are more protections for you in government than there are in nonprofits where you are really much more subject to the power of your donors um, than you are by the more indirect influence that comes from corporations and government. So this is a case where I would tell you to not be discouraged, and particularly for, you know, you coming out of a great school like the University of Texas, um, if you've got a big appetite for change, there's a world of opportunity out there for you. Will it be perfect? Absolutely not, but no, no fight worth fighting is. Well, um, I'm really, I think, at a loss of words for the, you know, great things that you've told us today, sir. I think, you know, at least me personally, I've already, I think, learned a lot from our conversation Again, I want to thank you, sir, for being with us today. We really appreciate it. Uh, I know all of my students uh, and PEAK members really appreciate it as well. 
Um, and, you know, with that being said, uh, thank you again, sir, and have, have a great day. Well, listen, thank you all. You know, please be optimistic, everybody. You know, I know we're, we've got a headwind right now. I mean, I feel bad, badly for Finley and for everybody else who's, you know, going through school right now and either it's either all virtual or it's hybrid. These are tough days, but look, only optimists change the world. Only optimists change the world. And so I really, really hope um, that you all will keep your optimism and that you'll and that you'll fight for the future that we all want. Thank you, sir. And uh, again, for any of you that want to share this talk with members that weren't here, uh, it will be on our website, um, for so people can view. Again, thank you, sir. Um, okay. We appreciate it. Have a great day. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. See you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.